Well, uh, hello, welcome to this uh, lesson on uh, the subject of the internet entitled, What Would Google Do? I've uh, wanted to teach this lesson and put it on tape for a long time and um, talk about the effect of the internet, especially in the work of the church. So before we start, I, I, I want to ask how many of you out there know about Google? Uh, most people today are familiar with it, but just, just so we can all be on the same wavelength for this lesson, let me try to give you uh, a basic description of what Google is before we go on and develop our lesson theme. Google is the name of what is commonly referred to as a search engine. Now a search engine is a service which finds and organizes information that is located on the internet. For example, if you go to the Google website and in their search box you type in, uh, for example, the Choctaw Church of Christ, where I happen to uh, serve. Well, it will list for you all kinds of information about this congregation that has appeared in bulletins and articles and references that have at one time or another appeared um, on the internet. You also can find a map on how to get here, some activities that are taking place, pages and pages of information about this particular group. One of the uh, fun things to do uh, with the internet that people often do is they type in their own name or the name of someone they know uh, into the search box and uh, Google uh, will list for them all kinds of information on that, uh, on that individual that has been posted on the internet um, in the past. Now Google's a really a wonderful service because it has cut down the time it takes to find any information about anything down to mere seconds. For example, do you want background information on the Italian Renaissance? You need to go to the library most of the times in the past. You'd have to find books and articles. But today, just type in Italian Renaissance into Google's search box, hit enter, and within seconds you will instantly get over two million articles and references and quotes about the Italian Renaissance. You want information about a favorite teacher, say uh, Dr. Stafford North at Oklahoma Christian University, simply type in his name and it'll give you all kinds of information about uh, Dr. North, the books that he's written, articles, places that he's preached, his background, so on and so forth. Uh, you want to find the nearest Walmart, what's playing at Tinseltown movies, uh, doctor ratings, how good the doctors are, school supply lists, it goes on and on. Now some people say that the invention of Google will change society in ways like the invention of electricity or the invention of the automobile changed our society. So powerful is the effect of Google and other similar search engines that in just a few years this technology has rendered several businesses and business models nearly obsolete. For example, online search engines have uh, literally destroyed the classified ad sections of newspapers across America. Why pay for an ad to sell your car or your baby stroller when you can list it for free on Craigslist and uh, find a, a buyer? Why go to the bookstore to buy a book when you can see it and order it and have it delivered to your home? Better still, why not copy your favorite bestseller to an electronic book for half the price? These e-books can store thousands of books on one device. You can, you can shop, you can order, and you can store all of your books on this one device, even on your phone if you prefer. Starting in 2010, uh, there were more e-books sold than actual paper books. That was the first time, in, first time in history that that had happened. This is why Barnes & Noble are near bankruptcy these days. Uh, beginning to shut down their stores. They just can't compete with online merchandising, especially of books and records and things like that. <clears throat> Department stores, legal services, computer manufacturers, universities, every sector of our society has been impacted by the internet age. For example, at Oklahoma Christian University, freshmen are provided with a laptop computer and an iPhone when they begin classes, and they can upgrade the iPhone to an iPad for an extra charge. 
I mean, this is just the new reality. I remember when I was at the university teaching a class as an invited lecturer, and there in the class there may have been 50 or 60 students and all of them had laptops. And all of them were, all of them were typing in information as I lectured on the topic that I had been assigned. Some of them were even checking the facts and the details and the numbers that I was giving them in my lecture in real time. Such is the reality of the internet age and education in our day. So when things change so radically and quickly, old systems come crashing down and new models begin to emerge. So my point here is that no company and no service has better adapted and exploited, even led the changes that are taking place than Google. Their business model, their way of doing things with employers and customers is setting the framework for how other businesses and institutions need to operate in this computer age in order to be viable, in order to succeed. It's no wonder that one of the more popular books in recent years has been uh, a title, um, What Would Google Do? by Jeff Jarvis. Now the author wasn't meaning to be offensive to Christians when he took the uh, popular What Would Jesus Do? and he named his book What Would Google Do? His point is that in the same way Christians look to Jesus as a guide for successful, a successful Christian living, business institutions should now look to Google for the guidance that they need to navigate successfully through a new world dominated by the internet and the changes that it has brought into society. Well, by now you might be asking, wait a minute, is this, is this a Bible sermon or is it a business seminar? Well, the answer is, well, it's a little bit of both. The church is the spiritual body of Christ, but at the same time, it's an organization operated by human beings in a world populated by human beings. We have guidelines from the New Testament in how to establish and organize the church, but much of the day-to-day -day function of the church, God has wisely left to the discretion and judgment of its leaders and members. And, and I say wisely so because God knew that the church would have to function in different ages and different cultures and different societies, each with their own particular technology and social custom. Today, we live at a time where in the last hundred years or so, our society has gone from being predominantly an agrarian or a farming society in the early 1900s to a manufacturing society in the 1930s to a service society in the 1960s to an information and computer age from the 1990s until the present time. And now we have 40% of the jobs that are in the information technology field and only 1% of the jobs in farming. Through all of this change, the church has had to adapt, not its doctrine or its love for one another, but in the way it does things. For example, the Choctaw congregation, as I said, where I, where I serve as one of the ministers in Oklahoma City, was formed as a result of a two-week gospel meeting in the 1930s. Think about it. Two weeks, 14 days in a row, 14 nights in a row of a gospel meeting. We couldn't do that today. We couldn't get people <clears throat> to come to a gospel meeting for 14 consecutive nights in this day and age. Another example, in the 50s and 60s, many churches supported one national radio program to preach and to teach thousands of listeners, but today, each congregation can stream their own services onto the internet. We can even have uh, television studios in our churches to produce our own education material as we do at the Choctaw congregation. So my point here is that one of the most successful organizations to navigate and take advantage of this new computer age has been Google. I propose that we examine what Google actually does and see if there are any lessons that we can use to help us navigate and take advantage of this computer age in our service to Jesus Christ. Our basic reference should always be to seek out what Jesus says and what Jesus does, but in this new and rapidly changing world, we shouldn't be afraid to adapt what Google does in the service of the church as well. 
Okay, five things that Google does, five things that Google does. Now in the book, the author mentions many things that Google has done to succeed brilliantly in the information age. I've chosen five of these that have a particular relevance to the church and what we need to do as well. So here they are. Number one, do no evil. Do no evil. The basic work ethic of the Google company is do no evil. In other words, make products and services that are good for the customer, good for the company, and good for society. Google aims at being a positive force in society because it believes this is the best long-term strategy for success. Now, it doesn't base this notion on the idea of faith or theology. It's very, a, a very pragmatic decision. They simply accept the idea that doing no evil promotes success better than purposefully cheating or trying to profit from a product that may harm its customers in some way. Of course, in the church, this principle is a given. We not only seek to avoid evil, we pursue righteous living as a goal based on our faith in God. Perhaps the thing that we can learn from Google, however, is that the good that they do is really felt by their customers because their services are free. In the church, we tend to be inward focused. And if you ask someone in the community, what has the, you know, if you went around, knocked on doors and you asked people, you surveyed them and asked them, what has the Church of Christ specifically done for you, for you personally? I'm not sure if too many could name any one thing we've done that has impacted them. Google has provided something good and useful for the community and they've done it for free. The church should learn to be known for this type of service as well. Number two, Google empowers individual growth in order to create corporate growth. Google's corporate structure is designed to enable individuals to be creative in coming up with new ideas and new ways of doing things. They're like a, a, cooperative, a cooperative of entrepreneurs. They encourage their employees to imagine new products or better ways to deliver existing services by providing them with money and resources in order to experiment. They know that their employees are their most important resource, so they nurture and, and encourage employee development and training. In other words, the management is there to encourage the others to take their jobs. Management is not there simply to protect their own jobs. In like manner, we need to remember that church growth is based on individual growth. We think that growing the church requires spending money on buildings or equipment or more staff, but these things are the result of church growth, not the cause of church growth. Every time an individual member decides to begin reading his or her Bible more regularly, the church grows. Each time someone decides they will start coming to Wednesday night services on a regular basis, the church grows. Every time someone commits themselves to greater sexual purity or uh, devote more time to prayer or choose to attend Bible class, the church, the body grows. Like Google, we can experience corporate growth if we focus more on the individual growth of each member. This work of ministry by elders and deacons and preachers, you know, it's, it's slow, it's not spectacular, but the results are sure. Principle number three, Google provides variety and choice in its services geared to customer needs and interests. In other words, Google gives its customers what they really, really, really want. They do this by listening. I mean really listening to their customers' feedback on their products and services. They provide ways for their customers to communicate with them and then they pay attention to what is said and make changes accordingly. A lot of companies have you know, a suggestion box that's attached to a trash can, or they have the attitude of Henry Ford who said to his customers, you, know, you can have any color Model T Ford that you want as long as it was black, because black is the only color that they produced. Well, in today's information age, that attitude doesn't fly because the internet has given people unlimited choices when it comes to products. 
and it has also given them a voice to express their opinions and preferences uh, you know, through blogs and uh, Facebook, Twitter, Tout, so on and so forth. Google knows this and Google embraces it. Its customers tell Google what they want and Google obliges them for free. Because of this, more people use their services and offer companies, uh, and, and other companies rather, pay to put ads on Google's uh, pages. This is how they make money. They bring millions of people to their site by giving them what they really, really want. And advertisers pay Google big money to display their products to the millions of people who use Google's free service every single day. Two billion searches per day. In the church, it's easy to become like Henry Ford. People can want and need many things so long as they'll accept what we're offering. And many times what we're offering, well, is dull and devoid of spiritual life, like that old black Model T. I'm not suggesting that we change our doctrine. I'm not suggesting that we change our commitment to following God's word carefully in all matters, including on how we live and how we worship. As a matter of fact, studies have shown that churches who have abandoned restoration principles in order to embrace more liberal ideas uh, you know, uh, for example, on women's role in the church or uh, they've instituted instrumental music in their services. These churches that have made these changes have not produced significant growth for their efforts. As a matter of fact, they, they managed to chase away people and then simply re replace the, the people that have left. So I'm against introducing non-biblical ideas in the pursuit of church growth for one reason and one reason only. It's not biblical. What Google does, however, is that, what, what Google does teach us, however, is that we have to listen more carefully to the needs of our members and our community. And like Google, provide ministry that satisfies those needs. Too many times we think the only thing that people need is public worship. So we spend a lot of money and a lot of time and effort to produce three public worship periods per week. You know, we spend millions of dollars on a building and a staff and paperwork and printing and books and so on and so forth so that we can uh, you know, uh, have three public worship services per week. But you know what? People need other things in addition to these. And this is where we're not paying attention. Widows need comforting. Young families need training and encouragement. Men need to learn how to be fathers and leaders and servants. The poor and the sick need ministry. The members need training in how to serve and how to evangelize. The community needs the gospel and teaching. Uh, those grieving from broken marriages and broken lives and broken homes, all these people, they need support. People need to worship God publicly, absolutely, and we do a good job in providing the opportunity and environment to do this in a biblical way. But this isn't the only thing that they need, and it's certainly not the only thing that they're asking for. The congregation that succeeds in this complex and turbulent time will be the one that knows what its members need and figure out a way to meet that need according to the teachings of the Bible. Principle number four. At Google, they understand that there is an inverse relationship between control and trust. Let me explain what this means. Google has learned that people under 40 years of age distrust top-down management systems. They're used to having input. They want to know where they fit in and why they do what they do. This doesn't mean that they are better than the previous generation, they're just, they're just different. And Google knows this since this generation makes up the bulk of their customers as well as their company. So the inverse relationship between trust and control works like this. The more you control, the less you are trusted. The more you cede control, the greater trust and respect that you gain. Under 40s interpret a person's desire to control as a sign that this person does not trust others, so they in turn are unwilling to place trust in that person. 
Now, at Google, the leaders entrust a lot of responsibility for running the company and developing new services, even evaluating and criticizing existing systems to people who are not necessarily part of top management. Their idea is that the people at the bottom want to succeed as badly as the people at the top. Everybody has a vested interest in the success of the company. So their willingness to allow employees as well as customers to be legitimate partners in improving and shaping Google as a company has won them strong loyalty and trust from the newest employee in the mailroom to the highest level of management. Now, the great challenge in the church is that most of the leaders, because of their age, I mean, we don't call them elders for nothing, most of the leaders in the church come from the generation where top-down management and organizational systems were the norm. Many churches complain that there's a disconnect between the leadership and the congregation because the elders function like a, a board of directors and they only meet to make decisions about budget items and when to hire and fire the preacher. Google reminds us that there are different organizational and management styles that come and go with each generation. Now, my point here is not that we imitate Google's style of management, rather that we look more carefully at the Bible and follow what it says our leadership style should be. And according to the Bible, our leaders are shepherds. They're not CEOs, they're not cheerleaders, they're not activity coordinators or economists, they're shepherds. And so shepherds uh, lead the sheep, and shepherds are with the sheep, and shepherds seek out the lost and stray sheep, and shepherds feed and protect the sheep, and shepherds sacrifice for the sheep. Every generation can relate to the shepherding role of elders in the church. I believe that when elders serve the church as shepherds, they gain the trust of every member in the congregation, no matter how old they are, no matter what generation they're in. And then finally, the last thing that Google does to guarantee success in the information age, Google knows what is the essential nature of its business. Google is a search engine. It enables people to find and organize information about any subject on the internet and it provides this service for free. It's about information and communication and whatever growth or acquisitions it makes, it always refers to its core business. It hasn't you know, branched out to sell cars or acquire a financial company or buy some kind of sports franchise. Although, although if you're reading the papers and keeping up with the technology news, uh, some of its uh, forays into the marketing of information collected uh, from its customers you know, has gotten them into trouble. But this very thing that they've done, this misstep that they've done, proves my point. They're moving away from their core business. And when they do, they get into trouble. So this idea of knowing what your essential business is and sticking to it is not easy. And it's not as easy as it seems. And a lot of companies have gone under because they forget this. Uh, a wonderful example, or a, certainly a clear example of this, happened in my hometown in Montreal. Montreal was the, uh, the headquarters for the Seagram's distillery business. Uh, a very old company, very, very wealthy company, was owned by the Bronfman family. And Edgar Bronfman Jr. inherited the business from his father. And so, and this was a multi-billion dollar a company, uh, but uh, Edgar Bronfman decided that, well, he didn't want to be in the distillery business, he wanted to be in show business. And so he bought a a, a, a movie studio and television studio and recording a company, a, you know, a, a, a music recording company and so on and so forth. And after several years lost billions of dollars and almost the entire fortune in these foolish uh, adventures. And so, uh, 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 near, and, and lost his company. And so he forgot what his core business was about, where his bread and butter was, was coming from. It's a clear example from the 
the, the world of, of business. Well, Google searches to improve its core business, which is a search engine, and how to find new ways to expand its use or increase its profitability, but no matter how big it gets, uh, 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 or how successful it becomes, it always remembers what its core business is all about. Well, we have many examples of churches forgetting what they're supposed to be about. We have congregations that focus on one ministry to the exclusion of all others and end up being you know, maybe a school with a church attached or a homeless shelter with a, a church attached or a food bank with a church as a second thought. You know, churches who think that their role is to change government policy concerning gays or abortion or, or military action. I'm not saying that the church shouldn't have an impact on society for good. I mean, after all, Jesus tells us that we're the light and we're the, we're the salt in, in, in Matthew chapter five. But if we are to survive and succeed in our rapidly changing world, we need to remember what the Bible says that our role is, what our essential business is all about as the church. Our essential job is not to take care of the poor. Our essential job is not to train preachers. Our essential job is not to make the USA a Christian nation or to unify churches or to grow larger congregations. I mean, these are all good things. They're all necessary things and things that happen as a result of our work but they are not our essential, our core job, our core role, our function. Our role is to call people out of the world in order to come into the kingdom of God. That's our core business. Why do you think Peter the apostle said, be saved from this perverse generation? Acts chapter two, verse 40. And again, he said of those who were saved that they have escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Second Peter chapter one, verse four. And Paul the apostle who says, for he delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Colossians one, verse 13. Our job is not to save the environment or to create social justice for the poor, or to restore America's Christian heritage. Our essential role is to call people out of the world, escape the world, reject the world, and become part of God's kingdom, which is the church. It's like the building is on fire and our job is not to paint parts of it or reconstruct the steps or anything like that. Our job is to say, get out of the burning building. That's our job. Now we carry out our function in three distinctive ways, very quickly. First, of course, by preaching the gospel to all creation, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. This tells the people how to leave the world, become disciples of Jesus Christ, repent, be baptized. That's how they leave the world. That's how they leave the kingdom of darkness and go into the kingdom of light. That's how they do it. Secondly, we witness to the world with holy living, Romans chapter 12, verses one and, one and two, offering our lives as a, a holy sacrifice. This is where all those good works and pure living ideas come in. You know, I help the poor, I care for the earth, I seek justice for the oppressed, I care for the orphan and the widow, not to save myself, not to change the world, I do this in order to validate my message, that my message is true. My holy life is a witness to the gospel I preach. Now, it may benefit the world, but this isn't the purpose of my holy living. Holy living points others to Christ and the truth of the gospel. Okay, I deny myself the things of the world, so you will pay attention to my message. And if you pay attention to my message because of my holy life, because of my good works, not only the people affected by what I do will profit, but you will profit also because you will believe my message and you will come out of the world and come in to the kingdom. And then thirdly, we do our core job by warning of the judgment to come. 
2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6, 7, and 8, where Paul talks about that. I mean, this is merely the flip side of our witness. We witness with holy living and we witness with the warning of the judgment to come. When the church stands up for what is right, and it denounces what is immoral, when it speaks the truth to power, it is simply warning of the judgment to come. Unfortunately, many ministers, you know, they get lost in the battle and they make this the goal of their preaching and teaching. In other words, free the slaves, elect a democratic government, make true Christians out of this nation or that nation's, uh, or, or let's make sure we elect a Christian president. And that becomes the focus of their preaching. I mean, again, these things are good, but they are the benefits of our preaching. They're the benefits of our witness, not the purpose. Think now, what good is a democracy in Iraq if all of them are still in the darkness without Christ? I mean, we get peace and we get oil for a while, but the goal of the church has not been accomplished in that place. So Google has succeeded because it never forgets its core business. And I say, neither should we. The church needs to be careful to remember that the task Jesus has given us is to call man out of the world, into the kingdom, not to save or improve or change the world. The world is lost. The world has already been set for destruction long ago. It has been set for destruction long ago and nothing we do will change that. The only salvation is to escape. Well, one last thing to remember before we close out our lesson. Google is a man-made thing. And like all man-made things, it will have its time in the sun and then it'll disappear. What we belong to, however, has been made by God and guaranteed by His word never to fail. Matthew 16, verse 18. So let's, let's take encouragement in this fact. But let's also learn from the things around us. Like Solomon once said, take a lesson from the ants, learn from their ways and be wise. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6. Surely, if we can learn from the ants, we can also learn from Google some lessons about how to better and more wisely function as a church in this new and dynamic information age. Well, that's the lesson on what would Google do. If you want more information, more lessons, more uh, videos and downloads, certainly we encourage you to go to our teaching website, BibleTalk.tv, and I hope to see you again soon. God bless you.